Okay. I have tried to do five fucking takes today, and everyone has been fucking sabotaged. Um, but without further ado, me and some ominous music are going to bring you the official second entry of reading Thomas Ligotti's short stories and breaking them down for you. And, um, stay tuned because, um, coming up, uh, in the near future, hopefully, um, honestly feel kind of cursed making videos right now, because just something goes wrong that fucking sabotages it, and I'm kind of sick of uploading chunks and saying in the description, oh, sorry, it's a phone died or whatever, so I only got this much of the video, here's the last 10 minutes, and, uh, the next fucking installment. I want this to be episodic, um, and I also don't want to break my style of stream of consciousness videos. Um, I will try to stick to reading the story and telling you what I believe it means. And um, I'm really excited to read the Crampton script for the X-Files because I am like a zealous fan of the X-Files. Uh, have been ever since I was a kid. It did kind of turn to shit towards the end, um, but I think Thomas Ligotti's script is up there with Shane Carus, a topiary, as one of the most tragic instances of scripts penned by very talented people, very creative people, that would have made for transformative viewing. Um, and, like, you know, The X-Files is known for being, like, kind of self-aware schlock. Um, right, right, let's be honest here. Uh, the show knows that. It pokes fun at itself several times. It does have some disturbing episodes, but I would say Crampton is the creepiest. Um, it is the most meta. Um, it gets the characters, it gets the atmosphere of the show. It doesn't do any disservices to it, um... Not that I'm even a big believer in that sort of thing. Um, and uh, has one of the best cold opens. Um, yeah, can't wait to share that with you. Uh, but this story, um, when we're talking about actual short films that have been made out of Ligotti's uh, stories, um, most of his stories, I imagine, just would work in uh, short film format. I believe he did take the X-Files script and expand it to cover the runtime of about an hour and a half. It hasn't gone anywhere, unfortunately, but, um, like, that that episode would have been, like, like a, you could have considered it the end of the X-Files, because it kind of portrays the X-Files as a TV show, uh, something where, um, you know, things are being put up and taken down just for Mulder and Scully. Um, it's like a joke that's being played on them. And, uh, it's great. But, uh, this one has been made into a short film, and it was, uh, penned by Thomas Ligotti, a screenplay. He's one of the few writers, I can say, who has the gift of, um, being a an amazing <clears throat> literary figure, you know, I think the descriptor that people bring up again and again, best kept secret in the war, absolutely fucking bang on. Um, if you're into like really morbid, uh, pessimistic uh, horror especially, um, and cosmic horror, um, this one, The Frolic, um, I'll give you a quick rundown about uh, just the general narrative, okay? So this is a much more, um, apparently, um, on a surface level anyways, and we'll get into this uh, as I read the story, uh, more cohesive than the world of the Nightmare Network, where, you know, in my last video where I went through that, um, it's like, you know, uh, surreal, just 
like uh, a panoramic array of sequences of like extreme corporate horror in this just sort of building and desolate landscape within a void. Like, I believe that's how he writes all his stories, because it seems that all that exists in this is a neighborhood, a prison, and the characters are, uh, he says psychologist, but the way he describes them sounds more like a psychiatrist. Um, he's the main character, and he works at this correctional facility. It's, uh, it must be like a supermax or something, because it's got a gen pop, and then it's got a psychiatric ward. And um, he's got a young daughter. <coughs> that this wife, who in my opinion is very conniving, is sort of implied that she is psychologically trying to get him to open up and talk about what's going on, um, why he's kind of in this mood, why he's doing, and uh, like she's very deliberate in like feeding him liquor and shit like that, putting on tones like this wifely beautiful housewife like here and they have a drinky a drinky poo sort of thing like but like it's kind of revealed through you know, it's almost like a, a internal monologue or just kind of the language outside of her dialogue uh, like that she is kind of playing for each other um what her motivation is who knows but maybe they were both going to school for psychology or whatever and um you know met and so she does have knowledge in that field because uh, she seems to be able to pick apart her husband um in a way that is very like analytical and deliberate um but not overt um so kind of dishonest in a way but um the, the, most of the story is like her getting him to open up about his experiences with this prisoner who is just known as John Doe. And he is, like, no one knows what his real name is, so they just call him John Doe. Um, they don't know where he's from. Uh, they put him in Gen Pop, uh, but because he's a child killer you know, and he, he's clearly out to fucking lunch, um, they had to transfer him to the uh, mental health Lord, um, for safety purposes, and um, so the psychiatrist is relaying why he believes certain things about this guy. Or no, he's mostly speculating out loud and kind of comes to some conclusions about him, um, you know, the veracity of which we shall discuss. Um, and uh, yeah, it just brilliantly sets up these pieces. And uh, there are some very clear overarching themes um, uh, and some, just some textual themes to me, and I will point those out. Um, and uh, this guy who does the frolicking, he is like a cosmic horror entity. And to be able to pull that off with just a human character is fucking impressive. Uh, you know, because co the cosmic uh, horror, like the entities within, have to remain mysterious. Their motives have to be hidden. They have to have this, like, seemingly malevolent uh, way of, you know, exploiting humanity for their own needs. But uh, this is a little more ambiguous. Um, yeah, so here we go. The Frolic. By the way, this is in his uh, short story collection, Songs of a Dead Dreamer. He's got a lot of good stories in it. So, and I'll also link the uh, short film in the description because it is pretty much like a direct translation of this, and I thought it was well done. In a beautiful home, in a beautiful part of town, the town of Nolgate, the site of the state prison, Dr. Monk examined the evening newspaper while his young wife lounged on a sofa nearby lazily flipping through the colorful parade of a fashion magazine. Their daughter, Marleen, was upstairs asleep, or perhaps she was illicitly enjoying an after-hour session with a new television she received on her birthday the week before. If so, her violation went undetected by her parents in the living room, where all was quiet. So this is planting 
some little seeds that grow throughout the story regarding the overarching theme, in my opinion, which is a conspiracy against the human rights does validate this. Thomas Ligotti, if he values any lives, lives on the planet, even though he's an anti natalist and he thinks we shouldn't have kids, it's the lives of children because they were forced into this world and they don't have, you know, cons like the, the neurological uh, ability to uh, ponder existential issues. Um, you know, adults don't have that level of innocence to them, purity, if you will. Um, he kind of talks about them in the same vein as animals, the same sort of innocence, not exactly the same, of course, but because it's just functioning in a way that isn't, like for animals, it's almost wholly mechanistic. It's instinct. It's, um, okay, I gotta eat, sleep, talk to survive, um, and then I die, and I, I, I'm dead, whatever. No, that's how animals are for the most part. Like we like personalize them a lot. Um, we project little attributes onto them, but uh, those are not even attributes they can comprehend. And same with a lot of kids. And um, I think the overarching theme here is kids who are brought into this world only to have their parents just leave them to their own devices. That's why the kid is going and watching TV when she's not supposed to, she's supposed to be in bed, um, you know, TV, that's your bedtime, I remember those days, don't you? Um, you know, but the way it's phrased illicitly, it's like she's not supposed to be doing that, but is it her fault because her parents aren't around to stop her? She is a child after all. And then there are themes of, um, similarly, uh, how kids are sort of robbed of uh, their childhoods um, and like we all were and forced into adulthood and our parents don't really um, prime us to you know be ready for the notion of oh yeah we die at the end of all of this and I guess maybe painful and if we don't do this that and the other we'll die sooner than later um, you know these are very disquieting revelations to come to you on your own. Very few parents have the depth conversation with their fa or their kids. I mean, my grandparents were very old, so they all pretty much died when I was like, you know, before I was double digits um, in age. I didn't really even get much of a talking to. Um, so that keep that in mind. <coughs> the neighborhood outside the house was quiet too. As it was day and night, all of Nullgate was quiet, for it was not a place with much of a nightlife, save perhaps at the bar where the prison's correctional officers congregated. See, there are places alluded to in this, but other than those allusions, they don't seem to really exist. So it's kind of, it kind of reminds me of Silent Hill. Uh, there's just these sort of neighborhoods and then a fog and a void outside. That's how I picture it anyways. Um, such persistent quiet made the doctor's wife fidgety with her existence in a locale that seemed light years from the nearest metropolis. See, that's what I'm talking about. You know, that sounds like in, it's just a turn of phrase, but maybe that's literally true. Because what is a story but an idea in a vacuum, unless it's part of a canon? But thus far, Leslie did not complain of the lethargy of their uh, lives. She knew her husband was quite dedicated to his new profession, uh, professional duties in this new place. Perhaps tonight, though, he would exhibit more of these symptoms of dis disenchantment with his work that she had been meticulously observing, observing in him as a late, so I can fucking speak to him. How did it go today, David? She asked, her radiant eyes peeking over the magazine cover, where another pair of eyes radiated a glossy gaze. You were pretty quiet at dinner. It went about the same, said Dr. Monk, without lowering the small town newspaper to look at his wife. Does that mean you don't want to talk about it? He folded the newspaper backwards, and his upper body appeared. That's how it sounded, didn't it? Yes, it certainly did. Are you okay? 
Leslie asked, laying aside the magazine on the coffee table and offering her complete attention. Severely doubting, that's how I am. I can relate, bro. It's kind of, even though it's a scary place to be in, where we're starting to realize that most things are just concepts that exist to give us a sense of familiarity and thus comfort in our surroundings. You know, uh, but, you know, uh, there's notions like the fact that most of what seems to be solid, just empty space. But because of our perception, uh, we see, you know, atoms zip zapping around um, as solid because we cannot track the speed of them with our eyes. If we could, I would be kind of confusing. Imagine that you see through walls, just one layer of atoms out there. It's very hard to like find your footing. <laughs> um, but I, uh, you know, I think I never give something anything any more than like 99% assuredness. And that's only something that I really, really would believe in. I don't even think there's any examples I can think of where I'm that certain of something. I think one of Thomas Ligotti's points is that certainty, like closure, is an illusion, like most things, uh, to give us this anchored sense of relief from our lives. So severely doubting, that's how I am. He said with this kind of far off reflectiveness, Leslie now saw a chance to delve a little deeper. Anything particularly doubtful? Only everything, he answered. Shall I make us drinks? That would be much appreciated. Leslie walked to another part of the living room and from a large cabinet pulled out some bottles and some glasses. From the kitchen, she brought out a supply of ice cubes and a brown plastic bucket. The sounds of drink making were the only intrusion upon the living room's plush quiet. With drapes were drawn on all windows except the one in the corner where an Aphrodite structure or sculpture uh, posed. Beyond the window was a deserted street light, lighted street and a piece of moon above the opulent leafage of spring. Ah, uh, spring trees, here you go. A little drinky for my hard-working darling. See what I mean? She knows what she's doing. She's playing some 40 fucking chess here. Um, fuck it, just feeding him alcohol so he can, you know, become uh, uh, distracted from his, uh, you know, his work and maybe isolated as well in a way, you know, putting some distance between his ominous fucking, like, stagnantly quiet and bland neighborhood and this prison, this monster works, you know, and that's kind of what we do when we drink alcohol or get fucked up, it's to take us away from reality, and so, the wife knows that that's how to open them up, and that's how you can open most people up. Alcohol was used by the Nazis as a, as a fucking truth serum. Uh, but yeah, that language, here you go, a little drinky for my hard-working darling. Who fucking really talks like that? And believes himself. She said, handing him a glass that was very thick at his base, and tapered almost undetectably towards his friend. Thanks, I really needed one of these. Why, problems at the hospital? I wish you'd stop calling it a hospital. It's a prison, as you well know. See, this is a point that I like. Call something what it fucking is. Um, we have a tendency to euphemize as a species, to make things cushy. It's like you're putting, you know, just a safety blanket on fucking every little idea, every turn, every, you know, material, bit, bob, this, or fucking that, you know, anything that is a little rough around the edges, we like to just fucking insulate ourselves, and in a way, make the world seem more flowery than it really is. Um, you know, a hospital is not a maximum security area that is full of criminally insane people. Um, and as you may know if you've seen Jim Cantrum's 
pretending to be crazy. They are not ideal fucking places to be. They are probably worse than prisons, um, as what prisoners, you can maybe predict them based on the motives that led to them ending up there. Um, but with people who did things because they're psychotic, uh, yeah, good luck. I've been in a similar environment, and uh, you know, there's no reasoning your way out. There's no diplomacy. There's no such thing as fucking diplomacy um, in those places. And uh, yeah, I mean, what hospital shares its grounds with an actual gen pop prison? You could say the word uh, prison once in a while. All right then, how's things at the prison, dear? Boss on your case? Inmates acting up? In? Leslie checked herself before things spiraled into an argument. She took a deep gulp from her drink and calmed herself. I'm sorry about the snideness, David. No, I deserve it. I'm projecting my anger onto you. I think you've known for some time that I can't bring myself to admit. Which is, Leslie prompted, which is that maybe it was not the wisest decision to move here and take this saintly mission upon my psychologist's shoulder. Her husband's remark indicated an even more acute mood of demoralization than Leslie had hoped for. Somehow, his words did not cheer her the way she thought they would. She could distantly hear the moving van pulling up to the house, but the sound was no longer as pleasing as it once was. See, this is another theme um, that Ligotti uh, uses a lot, and I remember this theme being articulated in words by Matthew McConaughey's character in True Detective, because True Detective very liberally borrowed, borrowed a lot of Lugati's ideas, and like word for word, um, like used parts of conspiracy against the human race in the script. But, you know, Matthew McConaughey's character, Russ Cole, talks about how, you know, as one way of like sort of anchoring ourselves um, to deal with, you know, the fucking sh shit show of being alive, we keep convincing ourselves that, oh, things will be better if we move here and get a new job and, like, fresh start, like, but, you know, there's a fucking phrase for that. It's, the grass is greener on the other side. Chasing a fucking dream. Much like, you know, the American dream or whatever. It's a big ball of fucking nothing. It's just one thing to keep ourselves fixated on. And it will never be actualized for most people. Sorry to say. And you also like him, you know, and a lot of actual nurses and doctors are like this in psych wards, mental hospitals, they are jaded. They got into it wanting to do society a service, realized that, yeah, you don't, you, you can't diplomatically um, deal with insanity. And insanity, what is it? But it's like a force of chaos. Um, for people with psychotic disorders especially. Um, and it brings chaos into the world for everyone else. And so I knew when I was in these fucking facilities, I was only ever gonna get something done, something brought up the ladder if I talked to the nurses who had just been there for like a year. Because they're still green around the gills, they still thought they were doing something altruistic and helping the fucking world. Doing the world a fucking service. Um, but you could even see them getting jaded over the span of weeks. Most of the nurses there fucking come in hungover, openly talk about how pissed off they were at the patient, um, just blockade themselves away from them in their nurses station, openly talk about disgusting sexual shit they do and drugs. <laughs> uh, yeah, like some of it was like pretty why the fuck are you even still working in this field? You, you do damage yourself and them at this point. Uh, but, you know, the doctors, same way, but you don't hear them chatting as much in those places. 
Um, and he's going through kind of the same thing. He thought he was doing a service for humanity, but now he's realizing this is maybe a foolish bargain he took. You said you wanted to do something more than treat urban neuroses. Urban neuroses. I, I guess that'd be people like me. Something more meaningful, more challenging. What I wanted masochistically was a thankless job, an impossible one, and I got it. Yeah, at least he's honest with himself. It's really that bad. It drives me crazy when people say that. <laughs> Leslie inquired, not quite believing she had asked the question with such encouraging skepticism about the actual severity of the situation. She congratulated herself for placing David's self-esteem above her own desire for a change of venue important as she felt this was. See, I think her aim out of all this, because like, you know, you can tell she was playing games here, is to get him to give in, to, you know, to get him to fold and give up on this dream of helping out at this hospital. It's actually a prison for the criminally insane and just regular prisoners, but you know, he's a psychiatrist, so he works in the wing where they keep insane people. Um, and he's regretting his decision, and she seems to be doing the same. I think she wants to convince him to leave. Like she said, she can no longer imagine the cheer of the moving truck leaving when they first got there. I'm afraid it is that bad. When I first visited the prison psychiatric unit and met the other doctors, I swore I wouldn't become as hopelessly cynical as they were. Right? What am I talking about? Things would be different with me. I've seen this in real life. Yeah. I've overestimated myself by a wide margin, though. Today, one of the orderlies was beaten up again by two of the prisoners. Excuse me, patients. See, no, he's not even calling it what it is because he wants to make things more flowery for his wife. Last week, it was Dr. Baldwin. That's why I was so edgy on Norlene's birthday. So far, I've been lucky, and all they do is spit at me. <laughs> well, they can all rot in that hellhole as far as I'm concerned. And yeah, you can see the booze is starting to try those words out from him better, and he really wants to say David felt his own words lingering atmospherically in the room, tinging the serenity of the house. Until then, their home had been an insular haven beyond the contamination of the prison, an imposing structure outside the town limits. Now its psychic imposition transcended the limits of physical distance. Inner distance constricted, and David sensed the massive prison walls shadowing the cozy neighborhood outside. That's what I mean. I mean, am I on it? I'm not on it. It's just like showing us the only places that really exist are this neighborhood and the prison. And might as well be beside each other. You know, he sensed the massive prison walls shadowing the cozy neighborhood outside. Right? <clears throat> Do you know why I was late tonight? He asked his wife. No, why? Because I had an hour long chat with a fellow who hasn't got a name yet. The one you told me about? Who won't let it? Uh, who won't tell anyone where he's from or what his real name is? That's him. He's a standout example of the pernicious monstrosity of that place. A real beauty, that guy. One for the books. Absolute madness paired with a sharp cunning. Because of his cute little name game, he was classified as unsuitable for the general prison population, and thus we in the psychiatric section ended up with him. According to him, though, he has plenty of names, no less than a thousand, none of which he's condensed to speak in anyone's presence. It's hard to imagine that he has a name like everyone else. And we're stuck with him, no name at all. Do you call him that? No name? Maybe we should, but no, we don't. So what do you call him then? Well, he was convicted as John Doe. Okay. In my opinion, he did not choose that because it is an anonymous term used for people who just, in general, have not been identified, cannot be identified. That is a term that is used 
specifically in stuff like cold cases, homicides, maybe even attempted murderers who got away and killed themselves or were shot by the cops and their identity is still unknown. Hey, even just like vagrants or whatever, how did that picked up, you know? They're not identifiable. They are a John or a Jane Doe. And like Gotti has this thing where he kind of likes to subtly say, um, we all might as well be John and Jane Doe's um, because we're just walking towards the grave anyways. <laughs> um, I'd like to point that out. And since then, everyone refers to him as that. They've yet to uncover any uh, official documentation on him. It's as if he just dropped out of nowhere. His fingerprints don't match any record of previous convictions. He was picked up in a stolen car parked in front of an elementary school. An observant neighbor reported him as a suspicious character, frequently seen in the area. Everyone was on the alert. I guess after the first few disappearances in school and the police were watching him just as he was walking a new victim to his car, that's when they made the arrest. But his version of the story is a little different. He says he is fully aware of his pursuers and expect even wanted to be caught, convicted, and put in the penitentiary. Why? Why? Who knows? When you ask a psychopath to explain himself, it only becomes more confusing. And John Doe is chaos itself. What the fuck did I say about cosmic horror and the villain, the threat, being a representation, an agent of chaos? Fucking, I'm at least two for two here. Um, what do you mean, asked Leslie. Her husband emitted a short burst of laughter and then fell silent, as if scouring his mind for the right words. Okay, here's a little scene from an interview I had with him today. I asked if he knew why he was in prison. This is so great, the seamless transition between not only location, but place and time. You know, yes, it's just them talking. It's just dialogue, descriptions. This is just a story. These are just their descriptions in the story. Why would their dialogue be any more real than the rest of the story? Their, their references, every reference they make to locations outside of the story that are never actually shown or described in detail except for just fleetingly as they talk about them. Um, it only seems like the prison and the neighborhood are real. But, um, yeah, like, this is what I'm fucking talking about. Um, so, now he's getting into his conversation with the guy. So he asked him why he's in prison. For frolicking, he said. What does that mean? I asked. His reply, mean, mean, mean. You're a meanie. That's what you are. That childish ranting somehow sounded to me as if he were mimicking his victim. Really had enough right then, but foolishly continued the interview. See, now back in the house, just describing what happened. Do you know why you can't leave here? I calmly asked with the poor variant of my original inquiry. Who says I can? I'll just go when I want to. But I don't want to go yet. Why not? I naturally questioned. I just go up here, he said. Thought I'd take a holiday, frolicking away. I do can be exhausting sometimes. I want to be, around, be in with all the others. Quite a rousing atmosphere, I expect. When can I go with them? When can I? And like Cormac McCarthy, he doesn't have, he said afterwards, John Doe said, just back to now, the psychiatrist describing what happened. Can you believe that? Or well, I mean, he's back now, questioning the blue scene he described to his wife. Can you believe that? It would be cruel though to put him on general population. Not to say he doesn't deserve such cruelty. The average inmate doesn't look favorably on Doe's kind of crime. 
they see it as reflecting badly on them, being that they're just your garden variety, armed robbers, murderers, and whatnot. Everyone needs to feel they're better than someone else. True. True. There's really no predicting what could happen if we put him in there, and the others found out what he was convicted for. Okay, so now I'm going to open up a question, and I w would really like, very pleased if you considered it. Okay, there's an ethical dilemma that will unfold here, and it is indicative uh, within what he just described, where, you know, these people who are in prison for maybe raping women, maybe being serial killers, maybe both, um, take out this garden variety, you know, fucking, uh, you know, barnyard justice on pedophiles or whatever. It's almost like the rite of passage now. Instead of going and beating up the biggest guy in the prison to fucking show everyone you're the tough guy, like, in the movies, um, you know, and kill the fucking pedophile. Yes, those guys get in, like absurdly lenient sentences for like essentially ruining the lives of children by molesting them. Um, and trauma is very much something that plants a seed which will flourish into this parasitic weed that just chokes a person they're fucking dead and it forces them into adulthood at an age where they really shouldn't be there but the ethical dilemma is this is the psychiatrist actually better than the villain i want you to keep that in your mind and ask yourself honestly um when it comes to the contrast between the levels of evil that are described here, or the evil can sometimes just be negligent. Some people are in prison because they drank too much, blacked out, got behind the wheel, maybe hit and run, didn't even know what the fuck they were doing, and now they're in prison, like, you know, fucking, that's pretty much how Oz starts. Um, what are people like that? Are they evil? So he has to stay in the psychiatric unit for the rest of his term, asked Leslie. He doesn't think so. Being interred in a maximum security correctional facility is his idea of a holiday, remember? He thinks he can leave whenever he wants. And can he? asked Leslie, with a firm absence of facetiousness in her voice. This had always been one of her weightiest fears about living in a prison town. But not far from their own backyard, there is a horde of fiends plotting to escape through what she envisioned as rather papery walls. Oh, I love that imagery. Um, fiends plotting to escape through what she envisioned as papery walls. To raise a, a child in such surroundings was the prime objection she had to her husband's work. See, this is why she wants them to move again. Um, she has this catastrophized sort of image of the worst. Now, obviously, it's not paper walls in the prison. You know, maybe for the purpose of the story, but, like, you know, one thing, just to make a quick comparison. In the movie Bo's Afraid, the first 30 minutes are essentially, like, a very anxious hypochondriac agoraphobe projecting their worst fears about the people outside that they'll be confronted with when they leave their apartment actually being personified. And something kind of similar is happening here. I think you'll see what I mean. I told you, Leslie, there have been very few successful escapes from that prison. If an inmate does get beyond the walls, his first impulse is always one of practical self-preservation. So he tries to get as far away as possible from this town, which is probably the safest place to be in the, the event of an escape. Anyways, most escapees are apprehended within hours after they've broken out. See, he's doing the opposite um, of catastrophizing. He 
maybe because he's all drunk, is almost blatantly lying. He knows that the fact is people are insane, criminally insane. It means they're not gonna follow, you know, the general data on what prisoners do when they escape. Um, and, you know, those words, words, they ring out as something being said just to kind of comfort his wife. They don't seem like believes them, in my opinion. What about a prisoner like John Doe? Does he have a sense of practical self-preservation? Or would he be, or would he rather just hang around and do what he does somewhere that's conveniently located? Prisoners like that don't escape in the normal course of things. They just bounce off the walls, but not over them. You know what I mean? So now he's just contradicting himself. Leslie said she understood, but this did not in the least lessen the potency of her fears which found their source in an imaginary prison, in an imaginary town. One where anything could happen as long as it approached the hideous. Morbidity had never been her strong suit, and she loathed this intrusion on her character. And for all his ready reassurance about the able security of the prison, David also seemed to be profoundly uneasy. Yeah, he's just like denying and, you know, in the language of Peter waffles off on the last messiah, which Ligotti seems to treasure a lot because he cites it a lot in the conspiracy against human rights. David is dealing with what he feels like is a very real threat by sort of burying it, excusing it away, drinking to distance himself, distraction, isolation. It's how most of us deal with life. He was sitting very still now, holding his drink between his knees and appearing to listen for something. What's wrong, David? asked Leslie. I thought I heard sound. Sound like what? Can't describe it exactly. A far away noise. He stood up and looked around as if to see whether sound had left some telltale clue in the surrounding stillness of the house. Perhaps a smeary sonic print somewhere. Hmm. Just scrumptious the way he words things. Even though the meat may be dry because it's going, hey, um, maybe meat in general is bullshit. Because <laughs> you know, everything he brings up is him kind of going, isn't this sort of like a folly that we all collectively engage in? It's kind of which is a joke that we have carried on, like our lives and everything else in it. I'm going to check on Arlene. Jeez, I thought someone is. He said, setting his glass down on the table beside his chair. He then walked across the living room. Of the three sta- segments of the stair, stairway and downstairs, or down the upstairs hall. Holy fuck, that's a sentence. He said, setting his glass down on the table beside his chair. He then walked across the living room, up the three segments of the stairway, and down the upstairs hall peeping into his daughter's room. He saw her tiny figure resting comfortably, a sleepy embrace wrapped about the form of a stuffed bandy. She still occasionally slept with an inanimate companion, even though she was getting a little old for this. Now it's interesting how they kind of condemn the things she shouldn't be doing, even though they're not really doing what they should be doing as parents. Um, But her psychologist's father was careful not to question her right to this childish comfort. Before leaving the room, Dr. Monk lowered the window, which was partially open on that warm spring evening. Now, I think Bambi is deliberately kind of like, like, it's been a while since I've seen Bambi, but uh, from what I can recall, Bambi was the mother who gets killed, and that kind of shatters the innocence of childhood for the main, uh, uh, what do you call it, young deer, I don't know, young deer. Um, sorry, I don't watch Disney movies on the right. I used to as a kid. Um, I'm not a kid anymore. <laughs> um, but it's, yeah, it's a symbol of the corruption of innocence in the child. And, uh, you know, going back to that question, that ethical dilemma, who's the real villain here? Um, 
he is telling himself that she shouldn't be sleeping with a stuffed animal because she needs to grow up, but he's assuring himself because he's a psychologist, he knows not to do anything about it. Um, so there's a part of him that wants to take her childhood away for her to grow up, I think. And then there's a part that just wants to continue living his life, doing his work, having drinks with his wife, and not being an actual parent. So, you know, where does he stand on the ethics scale? Right? Like, when he returned to the living room, he delivered the wonderfully routine message that Norlene was peacefully asleep. In a gesture containing faint overtones of celebratory relief, Leslie made them two fresh drinks. She's actually getting fucking plastered tonight. After which she said, David, you said you had an overlong chat with that John Doe. Not that I'm morbidly curious or anything, but did you ever get him to reveal anything about himself? Anything at all? Oh, sure, Dr. Monk. Uh, replied, rolling a nice cube around in his mouth. mouth. Fuck, I'm having that. I just like, I can actually do it. Alright, it's all good. Everything is going to have a happy ending. We're good to go. Oh, contrary, Sinclair. You could say that he told me everything about himself, but all of it was nonsense, the blathering of a maniac. I asked him in a casually interested sort of way where he is from. No place, he replied like a psychotic simpleton. No place, I probe? Yes, precisely. Hair doctor? I'm not some snob who puts on airs and pretends to emanate from some high-flown patch of geography. Geography? That's a funny word. I like all the languages you have. Where were you born? I asked in another brilliant alternate form of the question. Which kind do you mean, you mean? He said back to me. So forth. I could go on with this dialogue. You do a pretty good John Doe imitation, I must say. Well, thank you, Scott. <laughs> thank you, but I couldn't keep it up for very long. It wouldn't be easy to imitate all those different voices, accents, and degrees of articulacy. He may be akin to a multiple personality, I'm not sure but I'd have to go over the tapes of my interviews with him to see if any patterns of coherency turn up. Possibly something that detectives could use to establish who this guy really is. The tragic part is that knowing Doe's legal identity is a formality at this point. Just tying up loose ends. His victims are dead and they died horribly. That's all that counts now. See, that's, a, that's another, like... means of reinforcing that notion that I think is, like, pretty fucking obvious at this point. The notion of closure, uncertainty, you know, like, yeah, all these children are dead, and in real life this would be, like, unsolved mysteries that you know, you know, you know, you know, you know. Tonight on Unsolved Mystery, child killer, uh, you can identify this man, blah, 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 blah. Like, what difference does it make to the family? The kids are still fucking murdered. They know who he is. So they could understand an insane man a little bit more. Man. There's, there's finger quotes there because, again, cosmic fucking entity. In this case, um... But there were, um, are real men like him too, um, out there in the world, killing children. Um, I'm not talking like too much, I'm talking like people who are most likely in jail by now. Um, to give names and rhyme and reason, motive, whatever these people, it just opens up more doors for speculation, you know what I mean? It's like the more information you get, thinking that will be the closure you wanted for so long, and you think that because, just because you didn't have access to it at the time, and you get it, and there's a disappointment that just washes over you, and you go, 
Okay, now there's a, no, a whole new set of questions that I've got to consider. A bunch of new variables out there. That's why closure, I think there's an idea. It almost needs to be retired because it can never be fully actualized. Um, I like that he makes that point pretty efficiently here. Sure, he was somebody's baby boy at one point. But I can't pretend to care anymore about biographical details, the name on his birth certificate, where he grew up, what made him the way he is. I don't know. Aspie of pathology? It's never been my ambition to study all. Ah, sorry. That was a new word from Aspie. I think I am pronouncing that ass backwards, but whatever. It's a new word. My ambition to study mental disease without affecting some improvement. So that's why I waste my time trying to help someone like John Doe, who doesn't live in the same world as we do, psychologically speaking. I used to believe in rehabilitation, not a purely punitive approach to criminal behavior, but these people, those things at the prison are only an ugly stain on our world. The hell with them. Just plow them all under for fertilizer, I say. that but you drained it more aggressively i'm not fucking chugging all of this it's not alcohol it's fucking cranberry juice. um so yeah she the thing is there's a lot of i'm sure especially like like prison prison guards and just regular prisons who you know they fucking just hate the people they're forced to babysit all day, you know? Okay. For the doctors and uh, uh, criminally insane versions of prison are kind of sick of that. Um, he's obviously jaded. He's at the point, or he's at least drunk enough to call things what they are in his mind <laughs> and to say how he really feels. Like, I think in a way Thomas Ligotti would say this about just people in general without discrimination to hell with them just plow them all under fertilizer one another Leslie asked with a smooth therapeutic tone to her voice see that's what I mean she herself is a bit of a psychoanalyst David smiled now his his a liberal outburst having purged him somewhat of his ire. Let's get drunk and fool around, shall we? You got an interesting uh, sense of timing there, dude. <laughs> you must really be desensitized from uh, the crazy shit he hears and experiences on a daily basis at that hospital where he said his co workers are being, his colleagues are constantly being violently attacked. And he's just like, whatever. Here, I just talked about this child all the time. Get on. Leslie collected her husband's glass for a refill. See, for most people, that would be like a good sign, but probably deflection. Now there was reason to celebrate, she thought. David was not giving up his work from a sense of ineffectual failure, but from anger. An anger that was melting into indifference. Yeah, see, like I said, you become more apathetic. Now everything would be as if they've been before. They could leave the prison town and move back home. See, her, I knew this was her true fucking motive all along. In fact, they could move anywhere they liked. Maybe take a long vacation first, treat Norlene to some sunny place. Leslie thought of all these things as she made two more drinks in the quiet of that beautiful room. This quiet was no longer an indication of soundless stagnancy, but a delicious, lulling prelude to the promising days to come. Yeah, that's a good example of how we justify things to ourselves. That, you know, she walks into the kitchen and goes, Yeah, now this kitchen that I hated being in, basically, is a wonderfully illuminated place because there's a prospect of being able to get the fuck out of here. You know, we all kind of do this in our own way. The indistinct happiness of the future glowed inside her along with the alcohol. She was gravid with pleasant prophecies. 
perhaps this time is now right to have another child. Oh no. You'll have a child. Fucking acknowledge them maybe every now and then. Well, brother or sister or gnarling. God, I hate when people have children because they are fucking not happy with where they are in life. That's how you fuck up lives. That's why points like, um, I don't think this is like Dottie's point, but, um, I, thought this was one of my, I, I think I talked about this, um, in, uh, in another video, uh, David Scimitar or something, um, he did the, the whole, uh, uh, like, anti-natalist, um, theory, or reasoning, um, uh, which, I think regrettably um, became the go-to thing that people thought of when they uh, considered antinatalism and the justification people who are antinatalists have for it, um, which is, um, I think he calls it antinatalist, or uh, uh, asymmetrical antinatalism, that's it. Um, basically that it's immoral to have a child because bringing a life into this world plucking a life out of blissful non-existence into this world is inherently selfish and is often done for selfish reasons look at the amount of suffering compared to the amount of genuine happiness on this planet um kids that are actually being taken care of it is yeah it is skewed you gotta kind of if you believe otherwise I'm not going to try to convince you. Personally, that's not my main motivation. My main motivation being an anti-natalist, being against procreation. Um, this chap, like he says that, you know, it's worse than homicide, taking a life, bringing a life into the world. That does kind of make sense to me. Um, and I think that's kind of what's like being uh, hinted at here. Um, just, you know, just, just, that's not a good reason to fucking justify bringing a life into the world when your daughter is being, like, basically just ignored this entire time. Um, except for the one time that David checked on her because he was feeling a little uneasy. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think people should stop having kids because of stuff like overpopulation. And then, of course, neglect, which, yeah, sure, that fits into asymmetrical antinatalism, but I just don't think it's the best, um, it's the best, uh, way of trying to convince people who don't even know what antinatalism is, um, to, you know, follow that along. So I'm just trying to find some more music. It's copyright free, so YouTube doesn't do Okay, I'm gonna try this, but if this doesn't work, I'm just gonna go back to the last one. Sure. Um, okay. Animal genie seemed to be on standby. They had only to make their wishes and their bidding would be done. Yeah, just that simple, eh? Before returning with the drinks, Leslie went into the kitchen. She had something she wanted to give her husband, and this seemed the perfect time to do it. A little token to show David that though his job had proved a sad waste of his worthy effort, she had supported his work in her own way. With a drink in each hand, she held under her left elbow the small box she had got from the kitchen. What's that? asked David, taking his drink. Just a little something for the art lover and me. I bought it at that little shop where they sell things the inmates of the prison make. Some of it is quality merchandise. Belts, jewelry, ashtrays, you know? Like, she's obviously someone who can't call things what they are. You know, she's like, calling the stuff that the prison is selling to make money off of is uh, probably pretty despicable inmates like quality merchandise to justify her purchase and just being there. 
I know, said David, his voice at a distance from Leslie's enthusiasm. I didn't think anyone actually bought that stuff. Well, I did. I thought it would help to support those prisoners who are doing something creative instead of, well, well, instead of destructive things. See, that's the whole, like, sublimation aspect of, like, oh, yeah, we can turn them around by getting them to just do things that aren't murder all the time. Creativity isn't always an index of niceness, Leslie. David warned his wife. Wait till you see it before passing judgment, she said, opening the flap on the box. There, isn't that nice work? She set the piece on the coffee table. Dr. Monk now plunged into the depth of sobriety which can only be reached by falling from a prior alcoholic type. Yeah, if you know, you know. It doesn't even have to be alcohol. I've been on like a ton of acid and had to sober up for a little while. I'm just like, I was thinking clearly. Especially with acid, you, you don't get much time, but I think it's almost like an adrenaline uh, response. He looked at the object, of course he had seen it before, and watched it being tenderly molded and caressed by creative hands until he sickened and could watch no more. It was the head of a young boy, a lovely piece discovered in gray formless clay and glazed in blue. The work radiated an extraordinary and intense sense of beauty, a subject's face expressing a kind of ecstatic serenity, the convoluted simplicity of a visionary's gaze. Speaking pretty highly, <laughs> this dude. Well, what do you think of it? asked Leslie. David looked at his wife and said solemnly, please put it back in the box and then get rid of it. Get rid of it? Why? Why? Because I know which of those inmates did this work. He was very proud of it, and I even forced a grudging compliment for the craftsmanship of the thing. But then he told me the source of his model, that expression of sky blue peacefulness wasn't on the boy's face when they found him lying in a field about six months ago. No, David, said Leslie as a premature denial of what she was expecting her husband to reveal. It's a thing, you know. Anyone who says they have been in one of those, like, sobering moments of stark fucking clarity about something pretty fucked up happening. Maybe it just happened, maybe you've been in it for a little while, but you're still freaking the fuck out, and your brain just does not want to realize, like, that this is happening to you, and maybe yours, and whatever, um, like, death, death is a great example of that sort of feeling, um, and you just want to say, no, no, it's not happening, it's not happening, but chaos fucking reigns, and there's nothing you can do about outcomes that could be chalked up to chaos on a surface level. This was his most recent, according to him, his most memorable frolic. Oh my god, Leslie murmured softly, placing her right hand to her forehead, so I need my left hand because it shows up as my right in the camera, and my right hand is on the mouse. Then with both hands, she gently placed the boy of blue back in his box. I'll return to the shop, see, she said quietly. Do it soon, Leslie. I don't know how much we'll be residing at this address. In the moody silence that followed, Leslie briefly mused upon the now openly expressed departure from the town of Nollgate. Her estate. Geez, she's really like, just tunnel vision into getting the fuck out of there, which, hey, maybe in their interest, but, um, like, last week, not like next fucking year. Then she said, David, did he actually talk about the things he did? I mean, about, I know what you mean. Yes, he did, answered Dr. Monk with professional gravity. Poor David, Leslie said, lovingly sympathetic now that machinations were no longer required to achieve her ends. <laughs> well, that's nice. Actually, it wasn't that much of an ordeal, strange to say. The conversation we have could be called stimulating in a clinical sense. He described as frolicking in a highly imaginative manner. It's rather engrossing. The strange beauty of this thing in the box here, disturbing as it is, somewhat parallels the language he used when talking about those poor kids. At times I couldn't help being fascinated, though. 
maybe I was shielding my true feelings with a psychologist's detachment. Sometimes you just have to keep some distance between yourself and reality, even if it means becoming a little less human. As to my question, who's the villain here? Anyways, nothing you said was sickening, sickeningly graphic in the way you might imagine. When he told me about his most uh, memorable frolic, it was with a powerful sense of wonder and nostalgia. What did I say about nostalgia in childhood? Shocking as that sounds to me now, he seemed to feel a kind of homesickness that was home as a ramshackle ruin of his decayed mind. Hmm, sounds like a pessimist brain, not the pessimists or child killers. We are anti-life and that we typically don't want more life on the planet that needs, if anything, just to take care of the life that's already here. Um, but. You'll see the way um, John Doe's view of the world is very much like uh, an imagined version of this ramshackle view we have of the world around us. His psychosis had evidently bred an atrocious fairyland, which exists in a powerful way for him. And despite the demented grandeur of his thousand names, he actually sees himself as only a minor figure in this world. A mediocre courtier? 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 In a broken down kingdom of miracles and horrors. This modesty is very interesting when you consider the egotistical magnificence that a lot of psychopaths would attribute to themselves given a limitless imaginary orbit where they can play an imaginary role. But not John Doe. He's a comparatively lazy demon from a neverland where dizzy chaos is the norm. Excuse me. State of affairs on which he gluttonously thrives, which is as good a description as any of the metaphysical economy of the psychotic universe. <laughs> That's actually quite a poetic geography to his interior dreamland as he describes it. He talked about a place that sounded like a cosmos of crooked houses and littered alleys, a slum among the stars, which may be his distorted rendering of a life spent growing up in a shabby neighborhood. See, he doesn't know, he's just assuming at this point, trying to make sense of chaos, which is possible in some aspects, but usually in hindsight. Um, which may be his distorted rendering of life spent growing up in a shabby neighborhood, an attempt on his part to recast the traumatic memories of his childhood into a realm that crossbreeds a mean street reality with a fantasy world of his imagination, imagination, a phantasmagoric mingling of heaven and hell. This is the place where he does his frolicking with what he calls his awestruck company. His victim, basically. The place where he took his victims might possibly have been in an abandoned building or even an accommodating sewer. Accommodating sewers. Alright, anyway. And, uh, just, just, I want to ask. Shabby slum among the stars. What does that sound like? Where, where are all, uh, all the other slums in the universe? Uh, it's just kind of one. And it's full of life that is largely just withering away. You know what aliens say? We are a good species? If they existed, would they? Well, maybe they judge. I say this based on his repeated mentioning of the jolly river of refuse and the jagged heaps and shadows, which could certainly be mad transmutations of a literal wasteland, some gruddy and secluded environment that his mind turned into a funhouse of bizarre marvels. Less fathomable are his memories of the moonlit corridor, where mirrors scream and laugh, dark 
sheets of some kind that won't remain still. A stairway that's broken in a very strange way. Though this last one fits in with the background of a dilapidated slum, there's always a paradoxical blend of forsaken topographies and shining sanctuaries in his mind. Almost a self-hypnotic, Dr. Monk caught himself before continuing in this vein of reluctant admiration. See, I, yeah, I think this guy is supposed to be, like, emblematic of how we see pessimists. Or, well, I mean, I'm a pessimist, so I don't uh, stigmatize them, but um, so I'd be stigmatizing myself. Um, I do that all the time, but I mean, uh, not so much for being a pessimist, but, you know, Ligotti talks a lot about how pessimists are really, like, the most especially in contemporary times and the first world countries, most oppressed classes because no one fucking wants to talk to a pessimist. You know, people ask you, how, how's it going? And you're supposed to say, all right. Being alive is all right. When maybe you're having a bad day. Maybe you're having a bad day every day and you give them that same you're having a bad day line or you know, some variation of that based on what happened to you that day. They'll stop fucking asking you because they don't want to hear it. But they might, if they take the opportunity to get to know you, which they probably only do if they're in a situation where they're incentivized to do so, like it was their job, admire a pessimist's ability to be honest with themselves and the universe, even if it's at the detriment of the value we have spent all our lives ascribing to ourselves and the universe around. It's my interpretation. But despite all those dreamy backdrops and Doe's imagination, the mundane evidence of his frolic still points to crimes of a very familiar down-to-earth type. Run of the mill atrocities, if one can speak of the deeds he committed as such, Doe denies there is anything pedestrian about his mayhem. I just noticed this. Bambi, Doe, that is a very, very well done setup and must be a payoff, right? Well, payoffs are very di different through the lens of the pessimist. Because nothing is truly rewarding if you really think about it. Right? Just, just watch to see what happens. Doe denies there is anything pedestrian about his man. So, like, he's honest that he's not an average person, which most pessimists kind of are. They don't go, hey, we're special. They go, hey, no, we're not special, and we can admit it. Doe denies there's anything left to about mayhem. He says he just made the evidence look that way for the dull masses. That what he really means by frolicking is a type of activity quite different from, even opposed to, the crimes for which he was convicted. The term probably has some private association rooted in his past. Dr. Monk paused and rattled around the ice cubes in his empty glass. Leslie seemed to have drifted into herself while he was speaking. She had lit a cigarette and was now leaning on the arm of the sofa with her legs up on its cushions, so that her knees pointed at her husband. You should really quit smoking someday, he said. Coming from a dude who is fucking plastered. <laughs> And, uh, there is a looming threat already <laughs> hanging over them, and he's telling her to quit smoking. I think he's just trying to deny the reality of the real danger a little bit more. Leslie lowered her eyes like a child, mildly chastised. I promise that as soon as we move, I'll quit. Is that a deal? Jeez. She'll do anything to fucking move. Holy crap. Deal, said David. And I have another proposal for you. First, let me tell you that I've definitely decided to give notice of my resignation. i definitely decided. Yeah, you sound very sure of yourself. Isn't that a little soon, asked Leslie, hoping it wasn't. <laughs> oh, man. They really can't be honest with themselves. I don't know, even if they try. Believe me, no one will be surprised. I don't think anyone will even care. Anyways, my proposal is that tomorrow we take Norlene and rent a place up north for a few days or so. 
We could go horseback riding. I remember how she loved it last summer. What do you say? Schmaltz. I'm not saying that God is being schmaltzy. He's being deliberately schmaltzy because people are like that. Yeah, let's just take the skidoos up and rip around and just have a good time. Like, yeah, ride some horses. You know, nothing dangerous about horses. At least when I'm daydreaming about them. At least takes me out of this place where I should be kind of driving a little. No, fuck yeah. Sorry. I think should be dreading a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so, that sounds nice, Leslie agreed with a ripple of enthusiasm. Very nice, in fact. And on the way back, we can drop off Norlene at your parents. Jesus, you really just don't want anything to do with this child. Don't have another one, for the love of God. She can stay there while we take care of the business and moving out of this house. Maybe find an apartment temporarily. And I don't think they'll mind having her for a week or so, do you? No, of course not. They'll love it. But what's the great rush? Marlene's still in school, you know. Maybe we should wait till she gets out. It's just a month away. David sat in silence for a moment, apparently ordering his thoughts. What's wrong? asked Leslie. Just a slight quiver of anxiety in her voice. Nothing is actually wrong. Nothing at all, but... But what? Well, it has to do with the prison. I know I sounded very smug in telling you how safe we are from that place. Yes, you did. You sounded very unsure of yourself when you were talking about... Oh, yeah, well, maybe the data says that prisoners will try to get as far away from the prison as possible. Um, and so we're good. People tell themselves this type of thing all the time. I'm guilty, too. And I still maintain that we are. But this John Doe character I told you about is very strange, as I'm sure you've gathered. He's positively a child-murdering psychopath. And then again, I really don't want to know. What to say that would make any sense. Sorry. This me is not fucking doing it. I like the fucking... First few, let's get that done, yeah. Okay, almost there. Leslie quizzed her husband with her eyes. I thought you said that inmates like him just bounce off the walls, not... It's like the last thing he said that contradicted the thing he said before. Well, they don't listen to each other very well either. <laughs> yes, but much of the time he's like that. But sometimes... What are you trying to say, David? asked Leslie, who was becoming infected by the uneasiness her husband was trying to hide. Something that Doe said when I was talking with him today. Nothing really definite. Oh yeah, that reminds me. That the baby deer is called a doe. Bambi, don't. There you go. Something that Doe said when I was talking with him today. Nothing really definite, but I'd feel infinitely more comfortable about the whole thing if Marlene stayed with your parents until we can organize ourselves. Leslie lit another cigarette. Tell me what you said it that bothers you so much, she said firmly. I should know too. When I tell you, you'll probably just think I'm a little crazy myself. You didn't talk to him, though, and I did. The mannerisms of his speech, or rather the many different mannerisms, the shifting expressions on that lean face. Much of the time I talked to him, I had the feeling he was playing at some game that was beyond me. And now I'm sure it's just seemed that way. This is a common tactic of the psychopath. Messing with the doctor gives them a sense of power. You know what? Doctors can do the reverse of that. I actually met a psychiatrist uh, when I was in the psych ward for the first time. Couldn't leave. It was pretty bullshit, but... You know, I'm not going to fucking open that behind the doors box more than a glimpse. It was the instant where I met a doctor for the first time in the psych ward. She got really insulted by something I said. I, I, for the life of me, can't remember what it was. I just remember it wasn't, like, even that bad. It was, like, maybe something she took out of context. I don't know. Uh, but regardless, she full-on was like, I think you're a narcissist and a sociopath. 
And I was like, um, we've known each other for five minutes. This ain't a little like premature for you to pull the trigger on serious diagnoses like that. Like I try not to use the term narcissist or sociopath or especially psychopath like very liberally unless someone checks those boxes because like those words may have meaning outside of the DSM but the DSM is what people often those definitions are what people think of when they you know, when they think of sociopath Ted Bundy you know, Jeffrey Dahmer people who um, lived because they had this thrill of killing so they sublimated their existence um, you know or just scheme 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 like you know, these are weighty fucking terms like when I'm trying to say someone's like really full of themselves um, but arrogant is too light of a term like I'll say make a little name enough, which is like the old definition of um, a narcissist the antiquated one um, if it's mentioned in the DSM it's only making a reference to what was formerly known as megalomania and talking about narcissism or something but uh yeah i thought that was kind of crazy for i mean I, she obviously didn't officially diagnose me she was just saying that to me to kind of make me feel sh fucking shitty about myself which is kind of fucked up because i was like 17 years old me i don't know anyways tell me what he said leslie insisted all right i'll tell you I think it would be a mistake, though, to read too much into it. But towards the end of the interview today, when we were talking about those kids, he said something I didn't like at all. He enunciated his words in one of his effective accents. Scottish this time, with a little German flavor thrown in. Oh, God, I can't even believe... Like, I, I can't even believe those two dialects could co-mingle at all. That, that's chaos right there. Whatever the fuck that is, like, I'm trying to think of various balances between the Scottish to the German, like, maybe a little hint of German, but mostly Scott. Oh, God, that would be just atrocious on the air. <laughs> I don't think I can do that kind of accent. I'm terrible at accents. Anyways, in case you haven't fucking noticed, um, what you said, and I'm reciting, reciting it verbatim, was this. You wouldn't have been a miss be even larger nor a little Colleen on your own now, would you, Professor von Munch? So he said Colleen as C O L L E E N. Sounds a little like Marley and the daughter, eh? Hard to tell with such a fucking noobly de gawk sounding uh, accent, right? Eh? Then he grinned at me silently. No, I'm sure he was deliberately trying to upset me. Nothing more than that. But what he said, David, nor the two Colleen, grammatically, of course, it should have been or, not nor, but I'm sure it wasn't anything except a case of bra bad grammar. You didn't mention anything about Marlene, did you? Of course I didn't. That's not exactly the kind of thing I would talk about with these people. And why did he say it like that? I have no idea. He possesses a very weird sort of cleverness. <laughs> like, he was almost in awe of this dude, just by being like, ah, he's a psychopath, and he's a bad person, and all people like him should just die covered in fertilizer, turned into fertilizer, or whatever it was he said. But he's like, you know, <laughs> when he, just, he gets into describing him, he starts showing his admiration for him, which again, he describes a stand-in for pessimists, and maybe this is a little pipe dreaming on Ligotti's behalf. I wouldn't say so because, you know, he is very well aware of the persecution pessimists face when they try to fucking talk. I have learned talking about pessimism is, like, the fastest way to get yourself, like, fucking kicked the fuck out of any social circle. No one wants to hear you go, hey, we're all gonna die, yeah, you know? <laughs> it's like politics at the dinner table is more appropriate than pessimism. It's a shame because I think pessimism is important. Hence why I am taking the time to put my fucking reputation on the line, my cards on the table, and hope that, uh, yeah, maybe people will benefit from that. I have no idea. He 
possesses a very weird sort of cleverness, speaking much of the time with vague suggestions and subtle jokes. He could have heard things about me from someone on the staff, I suppose. Then again, it may just be an innocent coincidence. He looked to his wife for comment. You're probably right, Leslie agreed with an ambivalent eagerness to believe in this conclusion. All the same, I think I understand why you want Marlene to stay with my parents. Not that anything might have him. Jeez. Yeah, they are doubtful of everything that is like a potential threat in all the wrong ways. Not at all. There's no reason to think anything would happen. No doubt this is the case of the doctor being out psyched by his patient. Maybe that's what I did to that one doctor. <laughs> but I don't really care anymore. I, I mean, I have, like, like most of the diagnoses I've been diagnosed with, with things I researched. Well, I mean, I researched the symptoms and I came upon different diagnoses, brought them up to psychiatrists, and then they actually did their research and were like, hey, yeah, you do have treatment for some major depression and ADD. And same with the pain disorders, and I brought them up to a fucking you know, specialist and shit. It wasn't very much special about those guys, for the most part. No, I'm not government. Um, uh, Canadian hospital or whatever. Any reasonable person would be a little spooked after spending day after day in the pandemonium and often physical danger of that place. The murders, the rapists, the drakes of the drakes. It's impossible to lead a normal family life while working under those conditions. You saw how I was on New Orleans' birthday. I know, not the best neighborhood in which to bring up a, a child. David nodded slowly. When I went to check on her a little while ago, I felt, I don't know, vulnerable in some way. She was hugging one of those uh, stuffed security blankets of hers. I like that truck, that's a truck. <clears throat> when I went to check on her a while ago, I don't know, uh, vulnerable in some way. She was hugging one of those stuffed security blankets of hers. He took a sip of his drink. It was a new, uh, it was a new one I noticed. Did you buy it when you were out shopping today? Leslie gazed blankly. The only thing I bought was that, he said, or she said, uh, pointing at the box on the coffee table. The only thing I bought was that, she said. What new one do you mean? <laughs> the stuff band you know, Maybe she had it before and I just never noticed it. Yeah, you probably don't notice a lot about your fucking child there, hair doctor. <laughs> um, well, if she didn't have it before, it didn't come for me. Come for me. Um, Leslie said quite resolutely, nor me. I don't remember her having it when I put her to bed, I said Leslie. Well, she had it when I looked in on her after hearing. David paused from the expression on his face. He seemed to be contemplating a thousand thoughts at once, as if he were engaged in some frantic rummaging, searching every cell of his brain. What's the matter, David? asked Leslie, her voice weakening. I'm not exactly sure. It's as if I know something and don't know it at the same time. Right under your nose. Right under your nose, guys. The doctor monk was beginning to know. With his left hand, he covered the back of his neck. Warming it. See, that's what they call a self-pacifying gesture. Gesture. Um, you know, body language stuff is mostly drum science. Um, you know, when it comes to criminal pathology, those like the Quantico guys and whatnot, I think they do call it a self-pacifying gesture to you. You go like that or whatever, comforting yourself. Um, but, uh, you know, who knows how much credence there is to that. Always leave room for doubt when considering anything. Dr. Monk was beginning to know, uh, so he you know, warming his back neck. Was there a draft coming from another part of the house? There was, a, was not the kind of place to be drafty, not a broken down hole in the wall hovel where the wind gets in through the engine attic boards and the warped window frames. There actually was quite a wind blowing now. You could hear it hunting around outside. You could see the restless trees through the window behind the Aphrodite sculpture. 
the goddess posed languidly with her flawless head leaning back, her blind eyes contemplating the ceiling and beyond. But beyond the ceiling, beyond the hollow snoozing of the wind, cold and dead. And the draft? What? David, do you feel a draft? asked his wife. Yes, he replied, as if some sobering thought had just come to mind. He's had two sobering thoughts this whole time. Yes, he repeated as he rose out of his chair and walked across the living room, ever hurrying as he approached the stairway, leaped up its three segments, and ran down the second floor hall. There's no man who's coming, goddammit. He knew and did not know. He groped for the light switch. It was low, the height of a child. He turned on the light. The child was gone. Across the room, the window was wide open, the white translucent curtains flapping upwards on the invading wind. Alone on the bed, was the stuffed down, torn, soft entrails littering the mattress. Now stuffed inside, blooming out like a flower, was a crumpled piece of paper, and Dr. Monk could discern. No, it was not a tight message of official business. Who would fucking deliver official business by going into your child's room ripping up their, like, stuffy that just seemed to materialize as far as you're fucking concerned, terror doctor. Who's calling him that? <laughs> yeah, I know. He's a bit of a dim one. Um, I know, that's like a hair doctor. It's like what they German needs to call doctors. And I think that would be used mockingly to kind of be like, yeah, fucking goose-stepping fucking psychiatrist. Um, but anyways, um, I'm just using it because his judgment is worthy of being mocked. And I think that's, you know, an intentional choice on the Ligotti's part. You can get people to kind of understand why people have a pessimistic mindset on things. And Dr. Monk could discern within the folds of a page a fragment of the prison's letterhead, but the note was not a tight message of official business. No, like, like post it note for you. Fuck off, child. Blech. You got mail. Bye. <laughs> but, you know, that speaks to the level of denial he has about the reality of his situation. He desperately stared at the words for what seemed a timeless interval without comprehending their message. Then finally the meaning of the notes sank heavily in. Dr. Monk, a monk, well, it's spelled like M-O-N-K, like, you know, the monks. Their silly haircuts back there. No, those guys, I guess, were friars. Same thing as monk. Um, you know, Vikings like to set them on fire. Chinese like to... Chinese Liberation Army fucking dudes like to go in to Tibet and kill him. Holy man, or whatever. Dr. Monk read the note from the inside of the animal. We leave this behind in your capable hands, from the black foaming gutters and back alley of paradise, and the dank windowless gloom of some intergalactic cellar in the hollow curly whirls found in sewer-like seas starless cities of insanity and in their slums my awestruck little deer and I have gone frolicking fitting doe and the deer are frolicking I see you in orange and doe David he heard his wife's inquire from the bottom of the stairs is everything alright then the beautiful house was no longer quiet but there rang